It's Bet to Win on a Monday. Hope you guys had a great weekend. I'm your host, Joe Fan. Appreciate you joining us, as always, here on the pod. Fun show for you here today. We've got an NBA playoff update. Also, Sean Green of the Sports Gambling Podcast is coming on to recap the NFL draft that was here in Las Vegas. It was a busy, busy weekend, Thursday through Saturday. A number of storylines to discuss, uh, and we will get to, uh, to Sean with that. First, I have a victory lap to take. That's because the Padres beat the Reds. Minus 104 was the money line on that, and they won comfortably against the Reds, who were just downright woeful. And your boy is on a winning streak. It's like the major league clip. And they win two games in a row. You win three. They call that a winning streak. Winner. Finished April at five and four plus 0.24 units. That's not much, but it's honest work. Profit is profit. Let's run through the NBA and what happened to get into the second round. Last Thursday, way back when... Since we last talked to you, the Sixers dominated the Raptors. 132-97 was the final. Uh, Joel Embiid, monster game, 33-10, and 10, but fractured his orbital, orbital bone and suffered a concussion in the final game or final minutes of the fourth quarter when the Sixers were up 29 points. Doc Rivers' rationale was, well, the Raptors had all their guys in, so I kept all my guys in. Doc Rivers making a suboptimal decision in the playoffs. We've never heard that before. So, Joel Embiid out games one and probably game two, hopeful to return in Philly for game three and four against the Heat. Uh, the Suns take out the Pelicans. They win on the road 115-109. Chris Paul, 33-5-8 and eight in that game. The Suns win the series 4-2. to two. But a little golf clap for the Pels, who won two playoff games and gave the Suns everything they could handle, taking that series to six games. I don't think anyone expected that. Certainly myself included. Devin Booker did return and will be back for the second round. Big news for Phoenix, the top seed in the West. Uh, the Mavericks won a thriller 98-96 over the Jazz. They covered as one-point favorites and win the series 4-2. The Jazz are gone. Mercifully, we don't have to watch that team play basketball anymore. And I'm fascinated to find out what happens to that roster this offseason because there's just no way that that nucleus stays the same going into next season. Donovan Mitchell probably stays. Rudy Gobert feels like he has to be gone. And I know Gobert is a regular punching bag, but some of the, the shine has kind of worn off the star of Donovan Mitchell, at least for the time being. He did not have a good series. Void of signature moments outside of the, the alley-oop to Gobert to win, what was it, game four? Um, and really keep them in the series, keep them alive. But he was horrible from three. Under 21% at 20.7% for the full series. Uh, and again, the clutch factor wasn't there from him. Uh, and so we can we can point figures to uh, Rudy Gobert and other role players. But Donovan Mitchell, got to have his hand up in this one. He wasn't near good enough. On Friday, the Grizzlies closed out the Wolves 114-106. Once again, finding a way to overcome a fourth quarter double-digit deficit. Um, and again, you talk about the Jazz. I wonder what happens to the Wolves as well and if they decide to move on from Carl Anthony Towns. Really a frustrating superstar who doesn't handle his emotions well and takes bad shots at times. I mean, you saw late in that game taking a 35-footer mostly contested four seconds into the shot clock. And it just doesn't feel like he's a superstar that fits in well with Anthony Edwards. And so um, maybe a Carl Anthony Towns... Rudy Gobert swap this offseason. I don't know why Cat would fit any better with uh, Donovan Mitchell. But uh, again, two rosters, the Jazz and the Wolves. I'm very curious to see what they do. The Wolves were a fun team to watch through the postseason. They were a pain in the butt for the Grizzlies. Arguably should have won that series, given that it felt like every game they had a double-digit lead and couldn't find a way to hang on down the stretch. Brandon Clark, who's been awesome in these playoffs for the Grizzlies, 17-11-5 in that closeout game. Um. And then day off Saturday, followed by Sunday, round two starting. The Bucks dominated Boston, 101-89. Uh, they went outright as four-and-a-half-point dogs. Giannis, 24-13-12. and 12, A robust triple-double in game one. The Bucks dominated the paint. Jason Tatum had a down game, just 21 points on six of 18 shooting, and nobody picked him up. No other Celtic had more than 12 points. That's where Brown 
uh, Jalen Brown, Al Horford were. And conversely, you had a couple bucks role players that stepped up in a big way. Drew Holiday was a star, 25, 9, and 5. And Bobby Port is 15 and 11, double double with some really clutch shots. It felt like every time the Celtics would either hit a big three or go on a run, it was Bobby Portis that would hit the answer or the crowd silencer. Um, and what's interesting is the Bucs have dominated all four games they've played without Chris Middleton. And that's not to say that they're better without him because they just won a championship with him. They are the reigning champs. I don't know, I don't want to disrespect the multi time all star in that fashion. But I do think it's evident that they are a deep team and have role players capable of embracing the uptick in usage. And you've seen that, whether it's Grayson Allen or Bobby Portis um, or Pat Connaughton. Uh, this Bucks team is on an absolute roll right now, dominating the two games in Chicago um, without him and then back in Milwaukee to close out that series. And then in game one in Boston, stealing home court. Um, they are now the favorites to win that series. We'll get to series prices in a second. And then Warriors eking out game one against Memphis in Memphis, 116, uh, 117, 116. Jordan Poole continues his absolute uh, tear in these playoffs, 31, 8, and 9, flirting with a triple double, but another, but another 30 point game for him. Draymond Green ejected late in the second quarter. We will get to that in a moment. And then the late game uh, heroics from Clay Thompson. I guess, well, he, heroics, and he made the three, the game winner, but missing two free throws down the stretch. You look at this game in the fourth quarter, the Grizzlies, a double-digit lead or double-digit deficit. They overcome it again. They take the lead. They have a chance to win this game. But at the end of the day, you don't deserve to win a game that you can't get a defensive rebound in the final minute. That Clay Thompson three was inevitable. I mean, you look at that possession, they had three shots put up before Clay Thompson's three. Finally goes out of bounds. They inbound it. Clay Thompson hits the dagger. Um, but when you can't get a defensive rebound, not only on that possession when Clay hits his three, but then Clay misses two free throws, gives you a gift. As one of the best free throw shooters in the league, missing two, you can't get a defensive rebound. So the Grizzlies don't deserve to win that game um, when you can't get a stop or you do get a stop, can't get a defensive board. But it is worth mentioning the refs continue to be such a negative storyline of these playoffs. Let's start with the Draymond Green ejection. It's the postseason. You have to allow an uptick in physicality in the playoffs. And I would also say with every series that goes by. Now, we're not sending things back to the Kevin McHale era, but the pendulum has swung so far in the other direction that should it have been a flagrant one where uh, Brandon Clark leaves his feet, Draymond Green grabs his jersey, didn't really make a play on the ball, kind of brings him down, but, but very evidently tries to hang on to him and hold him up to make sure he's not falling hard. It's an unnecessary play, not really a basketball play, didn't go for the ball, flagrant one, all good, no arguments here. But it wasn't a dangerous enough play, and he very obviously tried to hold him up, even all the way to the ground and help him back up. You can't eject somebody for that. And I think it's obvious. We all know he got ejected because he's Draymond Green, and that's what his reputation is. And he knows that's what his reputation is. But I just don't think you can eject someone on reputation alone in the postseason, in the second round, when I don't think it was dirty. Brandon Clark's not going to get hurt. He wasn't, you know, at full speed, off of one leg, going up for a dunk to where all of a sudden you, you take his momentum away and you're dragging him down by the jersey. He went off two feet. And you're just pulling him down. A joke to eject Draymond Green, in my opinion. Charm and soft from the officials. But then also at the end of the game, after Clay's missed two free throws, the Grizzlies got another gift because that ball goes out of bounds. Very clearly on replay off of Dylan Brooks. And I'm still trying to figure this out, but because no official on the floor was able to, or willing to, I guess is the better way to put it, make a call and say whose ball it is. They couldn't review it. And then they they go to a jump ball at, at center court. And the Grizzlies get it, call timeout, and they've got a couple seconds left to go and, and get a final shot and potentially win that game. I just don't get it. That's what you have replay review for. That's why you see all the NBA guys twirling their finger anytime there's any questionable call. They're immediately looking for replay review. And in the biggest moment of this game, you're just going to say, nah, we don't know. 
Let's go tip at center court. So bad. And it's, it's frustrating because you continue to see in every sport, I mean, whether it's the NFL, I'm, we're three weeks into the baseball season or a month into the baseball season almost, and I am ready for robo-umps because I just can't stand, you know, these egregious missed balls and strike calls running MLB games. But now we're in the, the NBA playoffs, and it feels like every game we're talking about the officials. You know, just a couple of days ago, last week, it was, it was Jason Tatum fouling out with another really soft call in the playoffs. Superstar player. Just brutal. Uh, updated series odds. The Bucks are now minus 140 after winning game one on the road. Uh, the Celtics at plus 115. The Warriors all the way uh, ballooned and juiced up to minus 550 with the Grizzlies at plus 430. Warriors up 1-0. It's hard to imagine the Grizzlies winning that series. They had a hard time with the Wolves. Had to play, you know, these heroic comebacks game after game to win that series. And they did so again in game one against the Warriors, but they were at home and Draymond Green was ejected in the second quarter. I understand. I don't know if I'm, even with that price for the Grizzlies, I don't think I'm, I'm biting. I don't think there's a ton of value there. I don't believe they're a live dog. Uh, the Heat are minus 370 going into game one against the Sixers, who are at plus 290. And the Suns, minus 290. The Mavs at plus 230. Uh, upcoming on the slate, Monday, game one, Heat, eight-point favorites at home against the Sixers. That total set at 208.5. Real quick on this series, I, I think without Embiid, the, the sole focus, not sole focus, but focus certainly comes on the shoulders. The spotlight shines on James Harden. And you have an interesting conversation here between James Harden versus Jimmy Butler. I know Jimmy Butler has already been talking smack in his media availability leading up to this series. James Harden sort of took a back seat. Not sorry, he did take a back seat. Didn't score more than 22 points at any point of that round one series win against the Toronto Raptors. But these are two superstars that are sort of. Uh, like enigmas. I mean, you had Jimmy Butler as a guy who went from uh, Minneapolis or Minnesota with the Wolves to uh, to Chicago uh, and the Bulls and then to the Sixers and then finally found a home with the Heat in Miami to where it feels like it's clicked. But until he got there, it's like, all right, can you win with this guy? They have now been to a finals with him that bubble season when they lost uh, to the Los Angeles Lakers. But James Harden is very much in the same way. Now, he spent much more time in Houston, and he won an MVP. But now that he's been to Brooklyn, and now he's in Philly, you know, can this guy get it done? Can you win with James Harden in the postseason? And he's going to have a huge opportunity without Joel Embiid, who at least will be out the first two games with his concussion and that fractured orbital bone in his face. Um, but they are an interesting pairing and matchup between superstars. Uh, also on Monday night, game one, Suns minus six against the Mavs. That total set... At 214 and a half on Tuesday, game two, Celtics minus four versus the Bucs. Uh, the Celtics will look to even the series. A must-win game for them. You can't go down 0-2 to Milwaukee to play the reigning champs um, in their building and expect to come away with a couple of wins. That total set at 214 and a half. Um, and game two, Warriors minus two versus the Grizzlies. That total at 226 and a half. The Warriors up 1-0, looking to sweep and steal two games on the road before coming back home for games three and four. Warriors are also the uh, NBA championship heavy favorites at plus 250. The Suns at plus 300. And the Bucks leading the Eastern Conference odds at plus 450, jumping the Celtics after their game one road win. All right, let's bring in our guest. He is Sean Green of the Sports Gambling Podcast and the Blue Wire Network of Podcasts. Follow him on Twitter at Sean T. Green. Sean, welcome back to the show, man. It's good to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it. Sean, you were just out here with Ryan, your co-host on SGP. Uh, but I, I want to get to the NBA before talking about the draft. You're rocking your Joel Embiid jersey. You're a Philly oh, guy. Yeah. Are you giving your Sixers any shot? They're eight-point dogs uh, on Monday evening in game one against the Heat. They don't have Joel Embiid in this one with the concussion, the fractured orbital bone. What's your temperature on this series going into game one? <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, yeah, obviously you like them way better if they have Embiid here. I was unfortunately the guy who bet the series uh, right before, like literally I bet the series, then refreshed Twitter and saw that uh, he was out with the orbital fracture. Now, 
stuff has since come out that they feel pretty optimistic that he is going to be there for game three, game four in Philly. I think that gives the Sixers enough hope. All they really have to do is go down to Miami and steal one of these games. If, you know, whether it's the first game, the second game, if, you know, Maxi and Harden can can put together a game and steal one of these, I'm feeling amazing. So I do think if you actually look at the series price and stuff, I think there is a little fun value on the Sixers. But yeah, I mean, eight point dogs, eight point dogs for a reason. But, you know, Miami has had a little bit of time off here. And, you know, Maxi's been playing really well. Harden has a chance to step up and show he can still score. So, yeah, I think we're live dogs coming into Monday night. The Sixers plus 290 in the series price if you're looking for some value there. Um, are you upset with Doc Rivers for having him beating the game to begin with up 29 <laughs> points in the final couple minutes of that game? Yeah, I mean, yes, he he deserves a lot of crap. But again, it was it was a very freak injury. It could have happened at any point. I'll save my attacks on Doc uh, when he when he blows some sort of, I, I was just happy he didn't blow a three, nothing lead. Um, so uh, with doc, it's always like, what are you going to complain about? There's always going to be something. Uh, so the fact that they were able to put him away in six and not let it go to a game seven, I think was, was huge. So as much as I want to kill him for leaving and beat in there, I'll, I'll save it for this series. I'm curious, uh, of your Harden of, or your Harden, your evaluation of <laughs> James Harden. To me, you watch that series and, I get taking a back seat to Joel Embiid. This is his team, but but really he felt so passive across the board. And there were a number of occasions where, whether it's Embiid's hurt, he's not playing well, where it didn't really feel like Harden ever took the reins and took over. Didn't really have a signature moment in that series. Probably his best game in the first round against Toronto was when he had 14 assists in game one. He did have 15 assists in game five or game six, closing him out in Toronto. But you look at the scoring numbers, never above 22. He didn't shoot the ball well from three. I mean, this is a guy who is a, a former MVP, and now he just looks like a role player. And so I'm curious how you feel he's played so far. Yeah, I mean, he came in, you know, those first couple of weeks, it was the honeymoon period with James Harden. Oh, my God, they're going to they're gonna be, they should be favorites to win it all. And then slowly the kind of, you know, Hey, dogging a little bit, not being as aggressive, creating his own shot. Uh, this is going to be a great test for James Harden to show that he can still be a score at a high level in, in a big time game. These, these first two games in Miami without Harden. So I think that'll go a, a lot to set to like showing where Harden is. I was actually kind of fine with it to some degree where if he's going to create and get all these assists for Tyrese Maxey, who really was the star of that uh, series in a lot of way. I mean, obviously Embiid is the man, but Tyrese Maxey, I think really had a breakout series there. And, you know, I was kind of okay if Maxey's going to be the true number two score and he's going to create all this stuff for the other guys and then get his at the end. But you're right. Like he hasn't been as aggressive as a score. He's certainly not anywhere near an MVP uh, type player. But to the other point, is he better than Ben Simmons? Yes. I mean, we we went from literally a guy who did not want to play basketball, a guy who sat out an entire year because he had his feelings hurt uh, by the coaching staff and potentially one comment from Embiid in a post game uh, to to Harden, a guy who's actually playing basketball. And yeah, is he MVP Harden? No, and, and if he was, the, the Brooklyn Nets wouldn't have traded him. So I, I think we kind of knew what we were getting to some degree when we got him. Would I have liked to see more from him? Sure, yeah. And and I think this is a great opportunity to show that he still has something left in the tank. Yeah, the Ben Simmons saga is something, I don't know if there's a comp for anything no. we've ever seen in any sport. I mean, you you got Joel Embiid who's going to come out and play with a torn ligament in his thumb. He's going to play the fractured orbital yeah. bone. I mean, all he's got to do is clear the concussion protocol and he will be on the floor. And yet you have Ben Simmons who can't find his way to say, hey, let me give it five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever it is. Try to help my team in the postseason. No need to go round and round there. We're both on the same side of that conversation. Let's switch gears to the draft. You were here in Las Vegas for it. You had your shows here in the uh, Blue Wire Studios to win Las Vegas. Yeah, you checked out the scene at the draft near the Bellagio and the link. Did you enjoy the draft? How was it? What do you, what are your takeaways? Oh yeah. I mean, I, especially as an Eagles fan, I enjoyed uh, the uh, draft day trade of getting AJ Brown. Yeah. 
And I, I can't, I was, I've been texting with my uh, Eagles friends. I can't remember the time we had two good receivers at the same time. I mean, we had a little bit of a run there, very small run with Alshon Jeffrey, where he looked, you know, like top five, top 10 in that Super Bowl year. We had a run with T.O. all the way back in the early 2000s. Other than that, it has just been it has been one of the uh, many Philly curses that we, we Put can't some get respect one. on Jeremy Macklin's name, sir. <laughs> Well, you know, Jeremy Macklin and Deshaun Jackson, they were certainly in the mix there yeah. for the last time we had two good receivers, but that's all the way back in, you know, early Andy Reid days. So yeah, it's been a while. And, uh, you know, I, I've been optimistic about maybe some potential for Jalen Hurts, but now he is just set up for no excuses. Him, uh, you know, AJ Brown, Devonta Smith, uh, that's certainly an exciting uh, duo for the Eagles. So I was really Jacked about that. I mean, I I was pretty shocked. Uh, I thought more quarterbacks would go in the first round. I'm sure the people at win bet uh, wanted more quarterbacks to go in the first round. I know a lot of people were on the under uh, three quarterbacks drafted in the first round on the prop bets. Um, I thought I thought Malik Willis, in my mind, was a first rounder. I think he comes into the league with a chip on his shoulder. And I think teams like the Giants, the Lions, maybe even the Steelers uh, could look back and regret not drafting a guy with the massive upside of Malik Willis. Let's stay with your Eagles because they did steal headlines in round one. Obviously, the trade, sending a first rounder to Tennessee for A.J. Brown, giving him the four-year $100 million contract with $57 million guaranteed, um, but also trading up to get Georgia interior defensive lineman, one of the freakiest prospects in this year's draft, in Jordan Davis, who has some height, weight, speed combos that, that we haven't seen, I don't know, I don't want to say ever, but he is sort of in a class of his own in terms of what the metrics and measurables are. Um, how excited for a, for a guy who's gotten to root for Fletcher Cox for yeah. a decade plus, how excited are you for this guy who, not to say he's going to be Fletcher Cox, but another you know, projected to be impact interior defensive lineman from a pass rush standpoint. You know, it's, it's interesting. We had a like countdown to the draft show and I had a feeling that the Eagles might be involved in Jordan Davis going into it. I, I was a little skeptical just cause I, I like, oh, is he more of a run stuffing guy? Is he going to be able to rush the passer? He's had some issues with his weight. We talked to uh Chris long, a uh, fellow, uh, Blue Wire a podcaster on his uh, on his show about Jordan Davis, and he really sold me on the idea of like, no, you got to be excited about this guy. He's going to get in the room with this defensive line. They're going to get him coached up, and uh, he's going to dominate. I mean, when you have a guy that's 340 pounds that runs a faster 40 time than Patrick Mahomes, I mean, the upside is certainly, certainly very intriguing. And, you know, the biggest concern is, hey, can he can he keep the weight off? Can he keep his conditioning up so he can be out there as a three down lineman? And it turns out his mom is actually a massive Eagles fan. So if there's anyone you don't want to disappoint, it's your mom. So a lot of pressure for him uh, not to mess this up. And and as far as like his pass rushing ability and, and you talk about Fletcher Cox, this could be an interesting uh, transition point for Cox as he gets older. Maybe he's the guy they bring in on third down for pass rushing situations, especially this, you know, Jordan Davis rookie year. They have him out there for base downs, first and second down. And then when it's obvious passing situations, then you bring in Fletcher Cox almost as a specialist. And, uh, you know, as he's getting up there in age, maybe this is a way to kind of extend his career. So a lot of interesting stuff they can do with him on the offense or defensive line there. Devontae Smith. And AJ Brown, you figure complement each other just perfectly. I mean, they, they obviously freaky athletic, but very different body types and styles of receiver. AJ Brown, his only issue is staying healthy, but when he is healthy, he's one of the best in the game. Like you mentioned, setting Jalen Hurts up for success. Much has been made, especially from Kyler Murray's camp, that the Cardinals hadn't done enough. To, to set him up for success, which to me doesn't make any sense when you consider no. they signed A.J. Green last year. They had Christian Kirk already on the roster who just got paid undeservingly so, but still got the big contract from the Jacksonville Jaguars this offseason, went out and stole DeAndre Hopkins uh, from the Houston yeah. Texans. They drafted Rondell Moore in the second round. Regardless, they now trade a first rounder to go get Marquise Brown. What do you make of that trade, especially as it just comes on the heels of of the Eagles getting A.J. Brown, in my opinion, a far superior receiver for a very yeah. similar package. 
Yeah, I mean, if I was Kyler Murray, I'd be like, hey, what about A.J. Brown? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Hollywood Brown's fine, but A.J. Brown, you know, not related, but a uh, slight upgrade on the Brown uh, receiving name there. Yeah, I'm with you. It, 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 it's clear the Cardinals are building one type of team, and it's just speed. I mean, I get it. They play in the Dome. Um, they, you know, they have some opponents uh, like the Rams that they're playing essentially in a dome as well. They're, they're just building a team around the idea of like, Hey, speed is the way we're going to build this team. And that's all we care about. I mean, why not just keep Christian Kirk, um, you know, resign him to a, not that massive deal that he, he ended up getting, but there's a lot of stuff you could have done. And yeah, is, is Hollywood Brown. It, what, 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 what do you, what do you have Matt? Like a top 40 receiver. I mean, if you play fantasy, who are you drafting first, Hollywood Brown or AJ Brown? I mean, sometimes it is just that simple. I get what they're trying to do. They're trying to build a a speed first team. I still think it's a bit, you know, short sighted, and they, I think they gave up a lot of draft capital for for a team that has a bunch of holes. Um, I, I don't think they had the luxury there. I would have just drafted someone, uh, you know, taking a shot on some of these, like a Jahan Dotson, a uh, speedy receiver out of Penn State. I know. Uh, the producer in studio is a big uh, Penn State guy as well. So why not take a shot on him and not give up all that draft capital? So, uh, yeah, it doesn't really make sense to me, the Hollywood Brown trade. Yeah, I'm with you. I think it's, you, you mentioned fantasy drafts. Fantasy drafts this year are going to be fascinating at the receiver position because you have this oh, wide yeah. receiver carousel that's been going on. I mean, I still kind of have to remind myself that Tyree Kill doesn't play for the Kansas City Chiefs anymore. You have Debo <laughs> yeah. Samuel, who still wants out. Um, and then you have all of these rookies who, you know, project to be, you know, at least impact guys, if not stars. Um, so I think this year is going to be a whole lot of fun to see kind of how depth charts pan out and well, where yeah, the and, target and, shares and, go. Yeah, and, and to your point there, you're, you mentioned the rookies. I mean, previously, the, the logic was like, oh, don't draft a rookie in fantasy football, I'll never see the field. It takes them a while to figure it out. But now we have back to back years of Justin Jefferson and Jamar Chase, rookie receivers that probably won you your league if you drafted them. So I know there's going to be a, yeah, I can already see the articles now. And honestly, if you probably Google it, I'm sure they're already out it's of like, probably already which, written. Yeah. which rookie receiver is going to win you your fantasy draft? Yeah. Uh, Cause it feels like there could be one of them. And you know, you got to factor in fit where they're going. And to your point too, there's there's still a couple of musical chairs. Debo Samuel st- seems like he still wants out. DK Metcalf could get traded. How does Devontae Adams do in a dome with Derek Carr, his his uh, you know former college buddy? So a lot of storylines at the receiver position. Certainly, and uh, a number of storylines with the rookie quarterbacks as well. I think I was happy to see almost that teams exhibited some self control and didn't take quarterbacks just for the sake of taking quarterbacks. Uh, my thought going in was all that we have heard uh, from from media and draft experts is that these guys are not great in terms of, you know, when you're comparing them to previous years and the quarterback classes of years ago. Um, but you still, I think everyone kind of had that expectation that quarterback needy team would get desperate and say, well, maybe, maybe we can make it work. And I think that would make it a hard sell to your fan base. Like, wait, we've heard this guy isn't that good. You draft him in the first round. How are, you know, it doesn't do much for morale, but only one quarterback in round one, no quarterbacks in round two. So it was Kenny Pickett in round one of the Steelers, Desmond Ritter, Malik Willis, and Matt Corral, all in round three to the Falcons, Titans, and Panthers, respectively. And then you have Sam Howell down in round five to the Commanders. I thought where they went was very interesting, though, because you have Kenny Pickett in round one, and who I, you know, everyone I talked to mentioned him as if there was one guy who's going to be the most day one ready, even if the ceiling isn't as high, it's Kenny Pickett. Um, with the Steelers now battling with Mason Rudolph and Mitchell Trubisky, potentially a day one starter, question mark. Then you have Desmond Ritter with the Falcons, potentially the heir apparent to Matthew Stafford. Malik Willis going to Tennessee, a guy with a ton of upside. And Ryan Tannehill has been solid. But you saw what happened in the playoffs against the Texans, not the Texans, the Bengals, uh, certainly not the Texans in the playoffs last year. Uh <laughs> but against the Bengals, and he was the reason why they lost that game. And so I like to see them looking ahead and potentially getting a guy with great upside in round three. Matt Corral to the Panthers, they don't have a long-term quarterback. And Sam Howell, you, you would anticipate the Washington Commanders not having a long-term answer unless you really are a believer um, in Carson Wentz. Any of those five guys intrigue you in terms of player and landing spot? 
Well, uh, first off, I'm not a believer in Carson Wentz. Glad the Eagles uh, got rid of him. And we actually uh, drafted, uh, we, we signed undrafted uh, rookie free agent, Carson Strong. So the Eagles have gone from Carson Week to Carson Strong. I got that from someone off Twitter. But nice. uh, co- <laughs> coming back <laughs> to uh, what rookie quarterback I like the best, you know, give me, uh, give me Malik Willis. I, I think you put him down in Tennessee. Now, again, it, how long is Ryan Tannehill's leash, right? So I, I would be shocked if Malik Willis wins the starting job uh, this year. It does seem like they're kind of tied to Tannehill. I mean, Tannehill has a, a crazy kind of uh, contract structure. He is one of the highest quarterback cap hits this year. So I'd be shocked if he actually gets benched or somehow Malik Willis wins the job. But again, he doesn't have to win this job uh, year one. I think Correct. look at year two for Malik Willis. If they still have Derrick Henry there, uh, you know, maybe some of these receivers end up panning out. You get uh, Derrick Henry to support you in the running game. I, I think is pretty interesting. And again, I he, he to me is the most interesting guy as far as massive upside. You know, Kenny Pickett, um, in Pittsburgh, I mean, Pittsburgh is such a great organization. I feel like his floor is pretty high. Like he's not going to go out there and embarrass himself. Assuming he can beat out uh, Mitch Trubisky for the job at some point, which I think is pretty likely. I think he'll just come in and, you know, have a highly efficient offense that's set up for him not to fail. Kind of a, a kind of similar situation. I think in a lot of ways to what Mac Jones walked into yeah, in new agreed. England, uh, where they kind of customize things and and give him throws that they know he can hit. He's obviously very familiar playing in that city, so I, I think he's going to set up a uh, you know a very soft landing spot there for um, for him. But yeah, Malik is is the most interesting of the other guys. Yeah, I agree. Kenny Pickett, you couldn't ask for more. Uh, a kind of a core offensively of skill players that are there for you already. Then the defense, obviously that is notoriously known for carrying that team. It's a playoff team a year ago with the corpse of Ben Roethlisberger. You'd like to hope that Kenny Pickett can at least keep that status quo, if not be an improvement, should he win the starting job in training camp. Um, finishing the draft, putting a bow, at, bow on it in this way, you know, is there a, a team's draft or a, or one singular pick and destination or landing spot, I should say, that, that you are, are especially keen on? I mean, it's hard not to say the New York Jets dominated the draft, which normally is not something New York Jets and domination, not something you normally uh, put two and two together. But Joe Douglas just had himself a a hell of a draft. I mean, I, I Sauce Gardner, uh, their cornerback there, I think is it, to me. You could make a case he was the best player in the uh, in the draft, and then you know what they did at the receiver position. Um, you know, getting uh, Willis or <clears throat> sorry, Wilson, um, Garrett Wilson and uh, getting him like, I, I just love what they did. And then Jermaine Johnson, the pass rusher. So like it, they really, I mean, if two of those three guys hit in the first round, all of a sudden this Jets team should look a lot better. We were talking about the win totals on our late on our last podcast we did there in studio. And I, I, you know, the wind should be opening. There's pretty soon. I think the jets will probably open at like five and a half. And I really like the jets over five and a half wins. Cause I think Zach Wilson, he doesn't even have to make a massive leap. If he can just build a little bit on what they did last year. And then you, you know, you give him the new weapon in Wilson and you, you shore up the defense with, you know, arguably the, the best pass rusher and best cornerback in the draft. I mean, there were some people that had Jermaine Johnson as the best edge rusher in the class. I mean, a bit of a stretch, but to get him still as your third pick, I think is a tremendous value. So uh, we just have to wait and see how the Jets mess this up because they are the Jets. But right now, the, their draft looks amazing. Man, I want it. I want it to work for them. Because I'm such yeah. a Robert Sala guy. I worked for the Niners for a handful of years. Got to know Sala real well. Couldn't meet a better dude. And so I'm just rooting for this guy to be to be the one to get the Jets just to be competent. You know, like that's just start yeah. there. Get to competency Eight, and, then, nine. and then worry about potentially making the playoffs. Uh, I want to finish with this. Sean, you are yourself a stand-up comedian. I'm a big stand-up comedy guy. Uh, I want to get your sort of Top three in the game right now, uh, outside of yourself, obviously, but but maybe some yes. names that I know, maybe some names that I don't know that I can go find on the you know the Netflix Rolodex and, and put in the queue. 
Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, to me, Dave Chappelle is still the greatest. I mean, you could make a case again, greatest of all time. Uh, so, and he's still out there at a high level. So you have to give it up to Dave Chappelle, personal favorite guy we've had on our show, uh, talking sports a bunch over the years, but also just love his stand up, Bill Burr. And then if you're looking for like a probably less known guy, a uh, guy that I did a bunch of shows with here locally in Los Angeles, uh, Kyle Kinane, he is always one of, he's like a comedian's comedian where other standups always love him. So yeah, I'll throw a uh, Kyle Kinane there at number three. Does he have any like specials on Netflix or anywhere you can find him or just YouTube? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. He's all in Spotify. Uh, okay. Yeah. He's got some stuff on Netflix. So highly recommend checking Kyle Kinane out. Okay. Who's, who's your, who's your top? My guy, my guy far and away is Nate Bargatze. I don't, okay. I don't yeah, know. Nate's I've, very good. I saw him here when he was at the win. There's just something about his I'm an idiot trying to figure life out shtick that just makes me laugh every time. It's dry. It's well delivered. The timing is good. Like to me, like my my big pet peeve with comics or who like you throw in, you know, sex jokes or derogatory or cuss words, whatever, just to like try to amplify something that maybe is sort of funny, but not really sort of funny to me. Like Kevin Hart's like the king of that. And he starts laughing at his own joke. To be like, all right, are we up? We're all laughing at this because it's so funny. I love Kevin Hart from like an actor's standpoint. Like I think he in movies and shows is really funny and his shtick I think is good. But I've watched a couple of his standups and I'm just like, I don't get it. I also went back and rewatched Tambourine, uh, the Chris Rock special. And I thought that was tremendous. So he's always one of my favorites oh, yeah. as well. Chris, uh, Chris Rock. I don't care what Will Smith has to say about him. Chris Rock also up there. Hi. Yeah, that tambourine special was really good, uh, too. So, yeah, you throw Chris Rock, Bill Burr, and uh, Bill Dave Burr's Chappelle there. Love Bill Burr. Good stuff. Uh, he is the co-host of the Sports Gambling Podcast on the Blue Wire Network. Follow him on Twitter at Sean T. Green. Hey, Sean, good luck to your Sixers here in this series. Do you have, any, do you have a future on him outside of this series? Uh you know, I did. I did just get down on them to win it all. Is it twenty to one, twenty five to one? It you know, like post and beat injury if he does come back. So yeah, a small little sprinkle. I love it. It'll be fun uh, if they pull this out. Awesome. Good luck to your Sixers, Sean. Thanks so much for your time. Look forward to chatting again soon. All right, take it easy, Joe. Good hanging. Good stuff there from Sean. As always, big weekend for him with his Sixers in the postseason of the second round, and also. Um, the Eagles having a fantastic draft weekend, especially in that first round, getting Jordan Davis at 13 and AJ Brown in a trade with the Titans. Let's get to a promo, a winning pick and get on out of here on this Monday. Uh, our, our bet 10 win $200 promo is still running. New win bet users can receive $200 in free bets after they make their first qualifying deposit and place their first bet on win bet. Once that bet is settled, you will receive four installments of $50 free bets. Go to winbet.com or download the WinBet app for official rules and details. Winning pick time. It's a new month. Again, five and four plus 0.24 units in the month of April. Profit is profit. And we've won three in a row. We're on a winning streak, folks. Let's make it four. This is going to upset some people back in Seattle. But I'm going Astros money line at minus 133 against the Mariners. A little bit of an emo hedge for me, but I do like the Astros here. It's not too juiced. Minus 133 uh, makes sense in this spot with them at home against the Mariners, a place where they've dominated Seattle in recent years. Marco Gonzalez hasn't been good. Just one solid start in four tries. It did come against Houston in the Mariners' home opener uh, in week two of the Major League Baseball season. Seven innings, one earned six Ks, but no Jordan Alvarez in the lineup when that game took place. He was out for COVID. And also in his last start, he took a line drive off of his throwing wrist. He'd already given up an earned run to Tampa in that first inning prior to that injury taking place. So he's not missing a start. He is coming back on the bump, theoretically or, or reportedly at 100%. Um, but I'm not buying Marco in this spot. He's career two and six against the Astros with a 494 ERA, much of that damage coming in Houston. Um, I also like the over eight and a half as a possible option here as Jake Odorizzi has struggled this season as well. That's going to do it. Astros money line, minus 133. Looking to get May off to a good start as it's now May 2nd. This time is fine, man. It's crazy to think it's May in 2022. Uh, but get off to a 1-0 start. It would be nice. And win four winning picks in a row. 
Good luck to all your bets here this week, whether it's in the NBA or Major League Baseball. We'll see you Thursday right here on Bet to Win.